everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Alita Camp, and I am chair of Community Board 8 Manhattan. CB8 and all 12 Manhattan community boards have organized this evening's educational town hall on the three ballot member measures that you will be asked to vote on next Tuesday. We believe that an informed voter is crucial to democracy, regardless of how they vote. Tonight's program hopes to provide you with information and perspective on what the three ballot measures mean and how they might affect you, your communities, and the city. For those of you who are not familiar with community boards, they are the geographically bound city agencies established in the city charter to hold public forums on issues in their district, advocate for constituents on the delivery of government services, offer advisory recommendations to city and state agencies on matters within the geographic area, and work to improve New Yorkers' quality of life. Boards are made up of 50 volunteers appointed by their borough president and local city council members. I would like to thank the other Manhattan community boards and their chairs and district managers, especially CB8's district manager and the Community Board 8 Charter Revision Task Force for their hard work in bringing this event to you. I would also like to thank our co-sponsoring elected officials, tonight's speakers, and Gotham Gazette. It is my privilege to introduce those who will be on stage with me this evening. Tonight's featured speakers, speakers excuse me, are Rachel Harding of Falcon, Rappaport, and Berkman, Council Member Ben Kalos, and Commissioner John Siegel. Momentarily, we will be joined, they're not here yet, by New York City Controller Scott Stringer, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, and Council Member Brad Lerner, Lander, excuse me, bad at names. Our moderator is Ben Max, Executive Editor of Gotham Gazette. You can find each of their biographies in the program that you received when you came in tonight. Before turning this over to Ben and tonight's speakers, I would like to invite each co-sponsoring elected official to share a few words on this topic. We'll begin with Council Member Keith Powers. Thank you and good evening. And, and I always say this, but thank you for being here and spending your time to be a better educated voter. And I know that some of you already have probably some strongly formed opinions about some of these, but uh, all three I think are really uh, topics that you're obviously gonna have to vote on next Tuesday. And this is an opportunity to make sure you are uh, best situated to make that vote. But also the really important thing is that you are gonna be able to be ready to share uh, information with your neighbors and with your fellow community board members and, and, and those in your family about what to do on one, two, and three. And I've heard in the last few weeks a lot of opinions, people asking, you know, what do I do when I flip the ballot over? So thank you to Community Board 8 for providing a forum to actually discuss this. I will say that I actually sponsored a resolution earlier this year that passed the city council to put clear print on the ballot so people flip over the ballot because I am concerned always that is when people go out to vote, they're gonna do one page and not flip it over. So all of us, I believe here, have a great responsibility to make sure that people know both what's on the ballot and that what's on both sides of the ballot and to be educated for it. Um, I will just say, I just got a sneak preview downtown because I was with Scott Stringer and Ben Kalos and a couple of the other people are gonna be on here. You're gonna get a really good debate here tonight, a lot of good opinions. You've got a great moderator here, Ben Max, who probably knows more about city government than all of us in here. So he's, I know he's gonna do a good, a, good, uh, a good job. But this is a real rare opportunity to get people from all over the city to come and, and discuss what's going on, what's gonna be on the ballot. So I am deeply grateful to all the people from the community boards I see here tonight. I'm grateful for my, uh, my colleague, who's also a former community board chair, right? Community Board 7, Helen Rosenthal, who I think is up, up next. Um, but thank you to Community Board, thank you all the Community Boards doing it. But I wanna just end with the one thing that every elected official likes, which is a poll. Who's in support of Community Board term limits? Who's in support of Community Board term limits? Oh, a few lonely souls out there. And who's against it? And who's undecided? Okay. So you guys are really the swing voters here. Well, thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I know that some people have opinions about one of them, but there's three on there, and it's a good opportunity to get to know all of them. So thank you all for being here. Oh, my opinion, I'm, I'm letting, I'll am i let them debate it on the stage. I'll see you later. Well, you're happy, you're happy to sponsor. Thank you. Okay, and now I...
I'd like to invite up Council Member Helen Rosenthal. You have me over on the east side into your hood, and I sort of give you a hard time. Yeah, I'll never do that again. Um, hey, everyone. It's great to see the Upper East Side. I have a little bit of a different, my name's Helen Rosenthal. I'm a council member. I represent the Upper West Side of Manhattan, roughly West 54th Street, up to 109th, the river to the park, including the park and with a little Manhattan Valley carve out. I have a little bit of a different question. How many people here have made up their minds on the ballot questions? You, you're, you're good. Okay, okay. And how many people could be persuaded? That's great. That's really great. Um, a little bit of feedback for all of you who are not me looking out. Uh, I would say a quarter of the room has made up their mind. And, and a lot of people are here really listening. So unlike my colleague on the east side, I actually have come out um, with positions on all three ballot proposals. And the main, you know, and I, I uh, I'm not supporting any of them for a variety of reasons. But the main reason, or the main thing I would encourage you to do is read the fine print. Listen really hard to how people work their way around some of these proposals. The first proposal, which has to do with uh, campaign finance limits, my goodness, you're, you're looking at the person who got more uh, low dollar donations. Uh, in my first election, I had over a thousand low dollar donations. So I'm all about low dollar donations. I think that's a candidate's path to victory. I don't mean to give away any state secrets here, but you know, you want voters to have skin in the game. So that's not my problem. My problem with one is the transition period. That in 2021, they actually say, candidates, it's up to you. You can either follow the old rules or the new rules. And that is a nuance that I think will be lost on voters in 2021. No one's going to be asking anyone running for office, so are you under the old rules or the new rules? And I think that's concerning. So had that, had that, had a, if we're making a change in the charter, I think we could have been dispositive and just asked voters, choose, do you want these new lower limits? At which point I would have supported it 100%. Proposals two and three, what I would ask you again to listen for is try to hear beyond the words that sound great, which are civic engagement, participatory, and um, term limits. Those are all words that have powerful, powerful meaning. And progressives and liberals should stand for those things. I stand for those things. But I urge you to read the fine print. Because in this situation, what proposals two and three do is turn over power to the administration, whoever the mayor is, and really turn over the power to luxury real estate developers. And I think that that's exactly opposite of where we need our city right now. It's exactly opposite of what I think local neighborhoods uh, want. And so listen, please listen carefully. My opinion is that if you 
uh, as the ballot proposal is written, number two, with civic engagement, it's the mayor who already controls everything, who's going to now uh, take over in a way or, or also do participatory budgeting. I love participatory budgeting. Can I keep going? Yes. I don't see anyone walking in. No, it's fine. Okay. Um, I love participatory budgeting, um, and, and I've done it every year. This is going to be my fourth year with participatory budgeting. And unfortunately, what I've seen in my district is over the four years, slowly, the city agencies have begun co-opting participatory budgeting. So when we have community, board, community members give their, mm, does everyone know what PB is, participatory budgeting is? Okay, I, so, a couple minutes. Okay, I'm very quickly, participatory budgeting is a great thing. The idea of it is to turn over to residents, what do you think should be funded in the city's capital program? What would be better for your community that the city's not doing already? And probably the best participatory budgeting idea and the thing that won um, in my district was the idea of having a, um, a uh, food pantry have its own van so it could go around to other neighborhoods bringing fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay, now less time. Um, wow, really hard to shake that. Um, anyway, after that, the city agencies really clamp down. And now when we make suggestions to agencies, they basically say, no, nah, we can't do that, but we can do this other thing. And by the way, we learn a couple of months later that that other thing they were going to fund anyway. So watch out for that. And then, you know, term limits for community board members. I, over my five years, have um, asked community board, I have not reappointed community board members who really shouldn't be there anymore. But I've also had some vacancies and I've been able to appoint a, over a dozen new members. And the diversity and, that I've brought in, I'm very, very proud of. But boy, if we didn't have those long-term, long-standing institutional knowledge community board members who really know the neighborhood and know how not to be intimidated by luxury high-rise developers, their lobbyists, their public relations firms, their lawyers, if we didn't have that, we'd be just run over. So now I'm going to stop talking. Thank you very much for having me. This is intended to be educational and present both sides of all of the three ballots, and we will begin um, doing that right now. So I'd like to welcome our moderator, Ben Max, and our featured speakers to the stage. And as they join us, we will hear from the controller, the borough president, and the other council member. Thank you so much for joining us. moderator Ben Max, at which point I will leave and proceed. Thank you. I think Member uh, Godfrey, uh, uh, Assembly Member Godfrey, maybe. Hello, everybody. I think we're going to pause one second and let Assembly Member Godfrey say something. Oh, 
Well, good evening. Uh, terrific to see so many folks coming out uh, uh, on the night to uh, learn about propositions that are on the back of the ballot. Um, but I think they're really important, particularly, uh, I think it's important that people know about proposals two and three. Because uh, I think they really endanger our neighborhoods. Uh, you know, our community boards and their independence and their dedication and their level of knowledge are really critically important to our communities being able to stand up uh, to developers, to, uh, to City Hall sometimes, whoever City Hall happens to be. Uh, uh, Without that kind of uh, strength, uh, preserving our communities and protecting our communities uh, is really not going to happen. And having staff support that comes from the borough president, not from City Hall, is pretty crucial to that. And having a few members on a community board who have been there a while and who have been able to put in the time to learn the intricacies of zoning and housing finance and building codes and who remember uh, the last time a developer tried to do X, Y, or Z uh, is really important. You know, the developers and their lawyers uh, do not have term limits uh, and they get paid to know all the things and the details they know. Our community board members work at zero pay as volunteers, often night after night, far into the night, and are then expected to come to hearings and meetings during the day uh, as well. Um, so I think learning about items two and three and voting no is really important. Uh, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Ben Max. I'm the editor of Gotham Gazette. Uh, hopefully you have at least a little bit of familiarity with uh, our publication. If not, I encourage you to go to GothamGazette.com sometime at your leisure and read up on the coverage that we do of city and state government and politics. Uh, I'm happy to be here tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, you've obviously already heard some very strong initial points against some of these proposals. Um, so we're going to move into some of our structured debate. I saw the hands go up earlier that there's many people that seem to be undecided on at least one of the three. So we're going to get into discussion of all three in sequential order here with some different panelists staking out different positions. Um, the, the first couple uh, speakers you just heard from Councilmember Rosenthal and Assemblymember Gottfried obviously gave you some of the points that folks are making against some of the measures. So we're going to jump right in with some points from uh, folks that either helped create the ballot measures or support the ballot measures. Um, and so we're going to start with Councilmember Kalos with two minutes uh, of discussion here. We're starting with ballot question one, which is the campaign finance reform measure. Uh, and Councilmember Kalos can kick us off. Good evening. Can, every, can everyone hear me? Okay. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone who came out here tonight. Uh, a lot of folks feel like democracy is broken. In part, it's because folks aren't coming out to things like this at night, especially in New York City where there's so much to do. So the fact that you are here deserves a round of applause, please, if you consider it. <laughs> this event is going to be on WNET and it's being live streamed. That is something that I'm funding through my office because we want to have transparency at our community board so you can see how the uh, local town halls are working to represent you. I want to thank uh, our uh, community board eight chair uh, who I believe has been working with me on these charter revision issues since the mayor announced them back in January. I want to thank Ben Max over at Gotham Gazette. Uh, if you want to know what's happening in city government, there's one publication to go to, and that is Gotham Gazette. So if we can please thank them and make sure to visit GothamGazette.com. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay. Now your point. And I am hoping now my time will start. Uh, and so I, I am asking everyone in this audience to go out on Tuesday, November 6th, flip your ballot, and vote big money out of New York City politics. If you want to know how big the money is since 2010, over the last two citywide elections, $128 million has made its way into the pockets of politicians. That's a lot of money. And I was curious about how much of it was big money, over $2,000. Turned out to be $70 million. And where did that $70 million came from? It came from one in 20 contributions. So in a room like this, it would be that front row. And I might ask the front row, if you gave me $70 million, would you want me to do what you asked? That's a real ask. What about the rest of the people in the room? And so that's what's broken about our current government. And if you look at who gives 175 or less, it's only 10% of the money. Now, I have to tell you that you can give the mayor up to $5,100. Has anyone here ever given somebody $5,100? I, I can tell you I once offered somebody a gift around that much, but I expected her to spend the rest of her life with me. She <laughs> said yes, our daughter's actually nine months old tomorrow, and so one of the key things here is just money has expectations. People who voted for me or gave me $10 have expectations of me. They tell me they own me, and they tell me, go fix that pothole. But again, as the money goes up, and so our campaign finance system is great. I wouldn't have gotten here without it. It works at the city council level but it only gives you half the money you need to run. And as you run higher and higher for office, if you run for mayor, you need to get $2.6 million. Now there's a handout, because this is really complicated to understand, but we have a sheet that explains the breakdown between the current system and the proposed system. If you wanted to run for mayor now on small dollars, you'd need to get 15,000 people to give you $175. Anyone here know 15,000 people? Or you can go to 500 people who give you $5,100. They'll likely work in real estate, and that's how the system works. Under this change, it lowers it down to only a million dollars, and I, I think that that changes things because you only need to ask about four to 5,000 people for small dollar contributions, and I'll be honest, that's just about how many contributions I got when I ran the first time. My most frequent contribution in 2013 was $10. So I'm asking you to vote to Reduce the contribution limit from $5,100 to $2,000. Increase the matching from six to eight, and give candidates three quarters of the money they need to run. So the only people they have to work for is you. And I just want to thank the Mayor's Charter Revision Commission. We have one of the commissioners here. They went to all five boroughs. They did online town halls through Twitter. They did it over the phone. And I'll say that in Albany, the session lasts from January to June. This started in January, it kicked off in April, it had meetings in May, June, July, August, and September. There was more public notice around this than anything else. And last but not least, I've been working on getting this done for 13 years. I used my position as governmental operations chair to force a hearing in the city council. I got 32 sponsors, more than a majority. And for all the people saying, why can't the city council do it? It's because the city council didn't do it. And the only way we could is by coming to you, the voters, to get it done and get big money out. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos. So I, I think that um, Councilmember Kalos hit on these pieces, but just to clarify, and, and folks should look at the Campaign Finance Board's voter guide for all the details. We can't give you, you know, Councilmember Rosenthal mentioned looking at all the fine print. We can't be up here giving you every single detail of all three ballot measures tonight. So there is some uh, reading that needs to be done if you really want to have a, a strong grasp of the three questions. Councilmember Kalos did hit on three of the significant elements of ballot question one, which is it reduces maximum contributions to candidates, it increases the public matching amount, and it gives candidates public matching money earlier in the cycle uh, so they can run more viable campaigns based on that public matching money. Uh, so I apologize, I didn't set that, that framework up. I'll try to do that for questions two and three when we move in. But those are, those are three of the, of the principles around question one. 
I'm going to move to Rachel Harding to my left, who's going to give some of her take on why she thinks you should vote no on question one, and then we'll bring in Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. And thank you, Community Board 8. Ben and the panelists. Um, what hasn't been mentioned, they just mentioned three for the first uh, campaign finance proposal. There's a fourth one, um, and that, that, that hasn't been met mentioned, um, and I'll get to that. But big money, it's, it's sexy. It's, it's, a, it's a hot topic. Um, you know, it's something people can easily understand. It's charts and numbers. Um, but what was briefly, briefly mentioned was the third one about raising the cap from 55% to 75%. Normally, I would probably be okay with that. However, the charter doesn't touch the statement of need. I don't know how many people remember, but there was a big issue last election, um, mainly with the mayor, because it was dealing with the most money, that he said he needed additional matching funds. Candidates are only entitled to 25% unless they can determine they need, they fill out a form, hand it to the CFB, and say it's a statement of need. The CFB even said in 2017 when this is going on, this, is, this, this isn't working anymore, and we need to relook at it, but we can't look at it now, so we have to give the mayor his money, because he's entitled to it from the current standards, but this needs to be looked at. In both their post-audit report and their recommendations to the charter, they said, this disenfranchises voters. This is fraud. F fraud sorry, this is not working, not fraud, I apologize. Um, this is not working. This is not doing what it's intended to do. So they identified the problem, and they went so far as offered some solutions. The charter has not addressed any of those. We cannot raise the cap and give incumbents, really, additional money that they really should not be entitled to. So that's the, that's the third one. The fourth one, which has yet to be mentioned, relates to releasing public funds earlier, starting in February, which means candidates would have to meet the threshold, which is fairly difficult to meet for good reason, by the January disclosure. Now, I don't know how many challengers, how many non-incumbents can meet the threshold before the January disclosure of the election cycle. So this just benefits the incumbents, and I don't even know how it helps the challenger whatsoever. If anything, I really see this hurting candidates jumping in. They're gonna see their incumbent getting this matching fund money in February and say, I'm not gonna do this. If I don't get the money now, it's over. So the CFB is actually going to go back. The numbers are going to go down. What the CFB is meant to do to engage voters, to get more candidates, candidates out there to get more voices, that will significantly hurt it. And unfortunately, because all four of those things, decreasing the individual contribution limit, increasing match, increasing the cap, and having matching funds earlier are all on the same proposal, yes or no, three and four are more than enough to hurt everything else, and that's why you should vote no. Thank you. Now, Manhattan Borough President Brewer, you are the, the featured uh, debater for the second and third proposals, but you obviously have thoughts on one, so if you can give, you don't want to talk on one. I have enough trouble fighting two and three. Okay. <laughs> so, so then we're not, we're not quite at, we're not quite at two yet. Um, so we're going to come to John Siegel to respond to anything you just heard or bring up anything else you, you'd like to bring up. Uh, Mr. Siegel was a commissioner on the Charter Revision Commission. Good evening. So I'm one of 15 people who spent the summer studying the city charter and uh, making the recommendations that will be on the ballot Tuesday. I, I first just wanted to acknowledge two people. First of all, I met Ben Kalos many years ago at the City Bar Association's Election Law Committee, long before he was a candidate, long before he was a city council member, and he was an an avid advocate for campaign finance reform then, but not just an advocate, somebody with real expertise, and he continues to be, and I, I commend him for that. I also want to thank uh, the community board uh, chair, Alita Camp, who's my longtime, not old, longtime friend, uh, who I know first in her more exalted role as a mother and then as a lawyer and mediator and these certainly are the skills you need to chair a community board. Um, what we did was uh, we took a systematic look at the city charter and particularly issues relating to democracy and democratic process. 
We held hearings in all five boroughs. We held a series of expert panel hearings. We issued a preliminary of report detailing all the proposals that are now on the ballot plus others that we were looking at. We then had another full round of hearings and what we came up with were these three proposals. Let me just say a couple of things about proposal one. First of all, we held more hearings than any city charter revision commission has ever heard. Not one person testified at any hearing against the change in the campaign finance laws to lower the maximum contribution from $5,100 to $2,000. No one came and said that. It's clearly a civic consensus that it needs to happen. It is part, it is an evolution of a system that was introduced in 1989 that is a model system for the country that has fundamentally changed New York City politics. I dare say it's the reason that the elected officials that are on this stage are successful elected officials. We're not talking about people of means. We're not talking about self-funded people. We're talking about community activists who have succeeded in politics because of the public matching fund system. This is simply an evolution largely to fix the problem that while this is a great system, the contribution limit was too high. You can raise, you could raise $5,100 to run for mayor, but if you're running for Senate statewide, your limit is $2,000. We fixed that. I dare say there are a lot of people in this city who care about the city or middle class folks who will give $175 or $250 to a candidate. That will be matched eight times to one. There are a significant number of people, middle, upper middle class people, business people, professionals, who care about this city, who have an allegiance to a candidate or a cause, and they'll write a check for $1,000. Maybe they'll write two checks for $1,000. But the number of people who will write a check for $5,100 is pretty much limited to people of super means or super special interests in the result of an election. And we have fixed that. And that is the primary reason I think that you need to flip your ballot and vote yes on one. I can speak to the other specifics. I'm supposed to add this. I'm here to educate, not to advocate. <laughs> the city law department has ruled that I'm allowed to educate. Um, but I voted for all three of these proposals. And, and so if I'm advocating, I'm doing it in my, in my um, personal capacity. The other items in, in ballot initiative one, their technicalities, I can speak to them. I've done this, I did this for 20 years representing citywide campaigns before the campaign finance board. They're of no significant moment in terms of the impact of this system. This is an evolutionary fix to make a good system better and uh, that's where we're at. So in our last few minutes on question one here and either Councilmember Kalos or John, if you wanna jump back in to address the specific points that Rachel made about the fact that the proposal does not address the statement of need and that the earliness of the matching funds being allocated is advantageous to incumbents, yeah. uh, please do. So I, you know, I represented citywide campaigns under this system in every election from 1993 through the 2009 cycle. There was never a time in a mayoral race, certainly, or I don't think in the citywide races, where by the time that the matching funds are now gonna be released a little bit earlier, that all of the competitive candidates had not qualified for the matching funds. I, I, don't, think it's a, I don't think it's a big deal, I don't think it's a big change, but it's, if, if you're running for citywide office in New York City, you're not starting in January of the election. You're, you're starting in January after the prior election, and, and, and we all know it. In terms of the statement of need, the one thing I know is that the Campaign Finance Board is a high quality, high competent regulatory agency. The main way you know that is to listen to the squeals of those of us who have to deal with it from a compliance point of view and an audit point of view. 
they are not going to be handing out money the candidates don't qualify for under a statement of need. It has not happened. What the principal purpose they serve is to protect the public funds and to find, as they've done in virtually every election cycle, the candidates who try to game the system sometimes illegally and they referred for criminal prosecution. So it's just not a problem. Councilmember Kalos, go ahead. Yeah. I want to jump in on some, I, I feel that a little bit, a lot has been misconstrued. I, I ran against an incumbent, I ran against an incumbent assembly member, and there's only one publication that's ever covered how that running works, uh, which is actually Gotham Gazette, and they have a piece on something called ballot bumping. So has anyone here ever seen those people walking around with green sheets of paper or I think pink sheets of paper asking you to sign a petition for Democratic candidates? Has anyone ever seen that? Has anyone actually read the petitions? Okay, that's, that's a good thing, but I didn't see all the hands go up. So the issue is that happens in June and July. That happens before the current public funds payment is made. And so if you, a a person who doesn't want somebody to run against you, then you don't want an early payment because they can't use public money to get on the ballot. And if you read this piece by Gotham Gazette, the place you get rid of democracy is by knocking people off the ballot. Uh, so now the second piece is also just about attacking the statement of need. And yes, the mayor did get, uh, had controversy for taking money. And there is an issue there related to something called the United States Supreme Court. And so this is very regulated by the court. And what we would love to do is say that if your opponent has no money and uh, you have much more money, then you don't get money. And if your opponent gets a bunch of money, then maybe both sides should have money. But the Supreme Court has said you may not penalize speech. So we do have a statement of need. It is fairly direct. You're allowed to do it if you're running against somebody who is an incumbent elected official. So candidates who are, who are challenging incumbents always get it, and there are situations where the challenger gets it and the incumbent doesn't. Uh, there's also situations where if the person is a self-funder, I ran against a self-funder in 2017, that was a qualifier. The person sat there with the money in the bank account and they could have spent it. In my case, we, we sat there and then when they stopped spending, we said, we're gonna hand our money back because they're not spending the money. Uh, but okay. I, I, I don't think that was fair. And I think the last piece is, as a resident, and even as an elected official, I want my elected official taking as, if, if they're taking money, I want it to be public dollars. I do not want them taking any special interest money. I do not want taking them any big dollars. And every dollar that an elected official or candidate takes from the public means they're working for you and not a special interest. Okay, and we're wrapping up our discussion on question one with a final thought from Rachel. So I just want to say that, um, and I believe it was you, Councilmember Kalos, and I applaud you for this if that was the case, um, 2014, the, one of the local law that had matching funds in June. And it was a limited amount, but it was in June for the purpose, and I believe the intent was for petitions. Come July, as the council member stated, petitions are expensive and people ran into two problems. One, they ran out of money, so they either didn't get on the ballot because they couldn't afford it, or they couldn't afford to pay the right people and therefore didn't get on the ballot. Or two, they would loan themselves the money, have issues then with matching funds, and then that's a whole other issue. So the problem was, there wasn't money at the proper time. Solution was, give them enough, give them enough funds in June before the balloting process so they can sustain that. And I applauded that. I thought that was a great piece of legislation and I liked it. I don't understand why, and that hasn't been implemented. That was, that, that's 2021 that's going to be implemented for the first time. So I don't understand why, if you want to use that as a, as a test, a good test, but a test, why the charter went above and beyond without even this test being implemented and is now not only pushing it back to February, but also releasing additional funds. It's not just the limited funds enough for the ballot. Okay. That is my issue. Thank you. So we have to leave it there on question one. That was very interesting as far as I'm concerned. Um, we're gonna move on to question two that will be on your ballot, which is, yes, thank, thank you for, for all those thoughts. Question two on your ballot 
will be the question of yes or no to create a civic engagement commission. Some of this, again, was discussed at the top of the program a little bit. Um, but that commission will be charged with creating a citywide participatory budgeting system, uh, giving some support to community boards, uh, and doing a lot of other things not yet determined to increase civic engagement in the city. Councilmember Lander, uh, who we'll hear from in a minute, is, has been one of the bigger drivers behind this commission, uh, and he can explain the background on that, um, and, and we'll hear from him on, on the yes side. And then we have been joined by Comptroller Scott Stringer, as well as Councilmember Lander. And we'll hear from Manhattan Bre Borough President Brewer as well. But Councilmember Lander, you have been a driving force behind this idea, so why don't you start us off on question two. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's great to have you know, gotten my passport stamped by Borough President Brewer to be able to come from Brooklyn. And Council um, uh, And Councilmember Kalos. And I really appreciate being here. I do want to say just at the top, you know, it's very rare for me to be on the opposite side of an issue from Gail and Scott, who are two of the people I esteem the most in New York City government. They're but I. Split. Uh, hmm? <laughs> but I, I will say, at this moment in our history, having some issues we like disagree on and can have a good, thoughtful debate on is pretty great. So uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, to do it, even if I can't stand really disagreeing with Gail. Um, so what I will say is, you know, I don't think it's a secret that we face a really deep crisis in our democracy. I mean, if you look at what's going on all around, it is not currently functioning as a vehicle for people across lines of difference to have confidence and trust that they can come together with their neighbors through our public institutions to solve problems and try to make our neighborhoods and our communities and our cities better. People don't believe it and they're not living it. And while some of the problems are voter suppression and political violence, it's also true that we just don't have enough people deeply engaged. You guys are engaged, a few of us are engaged, some community board members are engaged, but for the most part, Maybe people vote, although most of them don't even do that. Maybe they do jury duty, but they don't do almost anything else. So the motivation here is we should put some resources into turbocharging civic participation. We currently spend almost nothing. There's no city department, there's no city agency charged with trying to get people involved in acting as stewards of our democracy, of our shared, our shared public spaces and institutions. So that's the idea. What I originally proposed, actually, was a lot less um, publicly open and controlled than this idea. I put in a bill last year to create an office of civic engagement because that's the only thing we could have done through city legislation. Um, and that, I will tell you, if it hadn't gone through this commission, would have just had like one commissioner directly appointed by the mayor like all the other agencies and offices. So even though this one has eight of 15 seats appointed by the mayor, Having the other seven appointed by the borough presidents and the, and the speaker means regular public meetings, transparency, and oversight much more than you have in essentially any other city agency. And I really think that's the relevant comparison here. Now, the first thing out of the box that they're charged to do is expand participatory budgeting citywide. And I was proud to be one of the people eight years ago who helped bring participatory budgeting to New York. And I will tell you, to me, it's like a gateway drug to democracy. Uh, you reach out to people and say, you want to have a little chance of making your neighborhood better in this very tangible, concrete way. And all of a sudden, that vacant lot on the corner, they can imagine as a storytelling garden. Or propose the idea for a greenhouse in their public housing development, or to fix up a decrepit bathroom in their kid's school. Uh, or mobile showers for homeless neighbors. Like, it's amazing what ideas people come up with. Uh, it really is magical, and they get involved, they work across lines of difference. Voters in participatory budgeting in New York City are more likely to be young, they're more likely to be immigrant. We, people who can vote who are not documented, so they can't vote in municipal uh, elections. They're lower income. They're much less likely before they vote uh, to have voted in city elections, but if you vote in participatory budgeting, you actually become, it's been statistically shown, more likely to vote and more likely to get involved in other civic institutions. So it really has that function. Then we need some place to run it. So that's the Civic Engagement Commission. They would also do expanded language access in our polls, which we should have the Board of Elections do, but they won't do. So this is a way to do it. And a range of other activities 
promoting civic service years, supporting people that do other kinds of civic volunteering like plaza stewardships and parks friends groups and library friends groups, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more, uh, where community boards would like help support them with resources as well. Thank you, Thank you Council Member Lander. We're going to go to Borough President Brewer and then Comptroller Stringer, and then we'll come back to you, Council Member Lander, for rebuttal of what your friends and colleagues have said. Well, I do want to thank uh, Mr. Lander because if he was in charge, it would be fine, but he's not, <laughs> and it sucks. And I'm vote number two. It was a bad process in, in terms of the Mayor's Commission because they did meet during the summer. Community boards aren't during the summer. Merrill controlled. Bad idea. Commissions are supposed to be much more uh, broad in their appointments, not just appointed by the mayor. I know there's another commission that is doing that. So I say bad process yields bad product. Um, and four of the borough presidents have signed on against number two. So I just want to give you a couple of reasons why I think Civic, Civic Engagement Commission is a slush fund. Um, yes, there are some good aspects to it, but let me give you the bad ones. Number one, it is mayoral controlled. So, so is the City Planning Commission, the Franchise Commission, the Landmarks Preservation Commission, the uh, Board of Standards and Appeals. You get the idea. We don't need, I don't care who's mayor, another mayoral commission. Number two, number two is the fact that it talks about something very, very vague. It's much too vague about something about what it will work on to bring agencies together. For God's sake, that is the role of the city council. When I passed paid sick days to the credit of the city council, we had a discussion as to where that would be enforced. And after many hearings, we decided that it would be in the Department of Consumer Affairs because it was in the Labor Department. You need public discussion of that. That should not be done by a mayoral commission. It should be done by the city council. If you're going to switch what agencies do, it should be done by the city council. I also just want to mention that what will it do to the community boards? And I think the borough presidents, at least in particularly Manhattan, thanks to Alden Bonillo, Deputy Borough President, and others, and what Scott said, in motion, we do a lot of work with the community boards. In fact, we have turned over 60% of the community board members. What? We have to work on legal issues and personnel issues. That is the role of the borough president. You don't need duplicative. And what the hell has the CAU, Community Assistance Agency, been doing for the last five years? Under previous borough presidents and previous mayors, they did this work of the Civic Engagement Commission. That's what a CAU should be doing. So you're going to be uh, definitely finding ways to duplicate, and in a time and age when we don't need duplication of city agencies, we don't need silos of city agencies, this commission would do the same. Participatory budgeting is excellent. It can be done. You don't need a whole commission to do that. So all the good aspects of this slush fund could be done with a current city agency structure and parts of this civic engagement commission should be done in the open by the city council, not in a closed, even though it would be open. During the summer, I went to the Bronx hearing of this particular mayor's charter revision commission because I couldn't go to the Manhattan. If there were 12 people there, that's a lot. And then that's the kind of participation you would have at this commission. Whereas at the city council, to the credit of the council members, you have a lot of people who show up, it's publicly advertised, and people know to go. So I vote no on this civic engagement commission. Thank you. Comptroller Stringer is going to talk next. And then we're going to, before we actually, after Comptroller Stringer, we're going to let John Siegel from the Charter Revision Commission defend the process of the commission that, that the uh, borough president just talked about. Well, first of all, I think I, I'm, I'm actually glad I came to hear the defense because I too went to a hearing that nobody came to. But uh, I wanted to be here tonight uh, to support uh, Gail's very excellent reasoning as to why we should not vote for ballot question two or ballot question three. And let me just say at the outset, just taking proposal number two, within the civic engagement proposal, there are a lot of well-intentioned parts of it. Participatory budgeting for some communities has been very successful, and I urge the city council and its council leadership to expand that if they see fit. Council members 
distribute millions and millions of dollars in capital money. And some choose to do it through participatory budgeting, some do it at town hall meetings. The more you engage, that is good. But this should be at the city council level. What disturbs me about the civic engagement piece is that we are recreating yet another bureaucracy that will not do what it's intended to do. First of all, we already have this. It's called the Voter Assistance Unit. How many people know about the Voter Assistance Unit? How many people know what it does? How many people know that nine members are on this commission? How many people ever met a commission member? <laughs> you get what I'm saying. This is a mayoral controlled commission that, does, that doesn't do what it's supposed to do or what it could be. So rather than fix what we That's have at another Charter Vision Commission, we now want to create the Civic Engagement Commission. But this is what I think is very problematic. You have a 15-member commission. The bottom line is, with the mayor's eight votes, the mayor controls. So the mayor, whose job it is, is to propose, in some cases, uh, development in communities, right? Sometimes the mayor supports big development projects. Sometimes city agencies try to support big development projects. The civic engagement will now be controlled by the person who is supporting the big development projects. And when it's not the mayor controlling the civic engagement piece, it's the city council that's going to have basically the rest of the appointments. And they usually, with some exceptions, rubber stamp the big developments. So the question is, who represents the people in the communities? And civic engagement starts with the people in this room tonight. It's called community-based planning. It's called giving resources to community boards and cut out this nonsense that mayors will somehow give voice to the powerless people in the city. It hasn't happened yet, and it certainly won't happen now. And I think the thing to do here, though it's true, and I come here tonight really not as controller, but as a former borough president who had the opportunity to actually do this work with the communities for eight years. I also served on a community board. And I could tell you that this commission did not spend the kind of time necessary that it would take to build out a proposal. And I quite frankly think it's pretty outrageous that we are using the Charter Vision Commission process, which is very serious, with all the ideas, with all the potential for reforming government, with all the great ideas that people have testified to over time, to come up with these proposals is insulting to anyone who cares about development and overdevelopment in communities. And we shouldn't get, let them get away with it. Now, now again, I happen to think, I happen to think that the history of Charter Revision Commissions, for the most part, basically are narrow mayoral agendas. And many times the voters say, you're overstepping. I think this is an overreach. We should definitely engage citizens. But the way to engage citizens is to give more resources for urban planners on community boards. The way to engage citizens is to create a model that speaks to the different varied communities we have. And then finally, the city council should do what the city council is supposed to do. We are a representative democracy. We elect people to do the job. And when they do it well, we reelect them. And when we, they don't do the job, we're supposed to get rid of them. Setting up false commissions will only get us false results. And while I respect, obviously I respect my friend Brad and Jonathan, who is a great lawyer, um, they, the commission did not do its due diligence. And I, would hate, I have to say, at the end of the day, this commission was driven by what was in the best interests of City Hall, not in the best interests of our community. And we have to call it for what it is. Thank you. OK. So we're going to come back to John Siegel for a couple of rebuttal thoughts on the commission's work and its process, and then Councilmember Lander on a couple quickish thoughts on the content around the commission, and then we're going to have to move on to question three. So let me just take a minute and respond to a couple of the process points that the borough president and the controller made. The reason that these proposals 
were formulated over the summer is because they have to be filed by Labor Day in order to be on the ballot. There is another Charter Revision Commission meeting now appointed by the City Council with the prime sponsorship of Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. And if our Charter Revision Commission had stayed in business and taken another year, that commission could not put proposals on the ballot next year. So the modest proposals that are on the ballot are on this year or on the ballot this year. Another charter commission is meeting, perhaps probably with a broader agenda. And so that's fine. The, the uh, Gail and I once worked for a brilliant political strategist who always said to us, the perfect is the enemy of the good. There are good proposals in this. Maybe it's not perfect. The question is, will we be better off with these proposals? And that's what you need to decide. I, I want to make one other point about the process. This was a citywide process. This was a citywide commission. I'm, I'm not in politics. I haven't worked in government for 20 years. But I went to these hearings this summer. And the differential in public participation, in public knowledge and education between the communities in this city is shocking. And yes, the borough president was at a hearing in the Bronx that was sparsely attended. It was one of, I believe, three we had in the Bronx. There were relative different ranges of participation. The hearing that we had in Park Slope in Councilman Lander's district went to like 11 o'clock at night because there were so many people and so many ideas. But in a lot of other communities, there is a lower level of participation, a lower level of knowledge, and we had to make citywide proposals. And I'll speak to this when we get to item three on the community boards. Um, but in terms of item two, let me just say this. This proposal requires participatory budgeting in every community district in the city. Most now don't have it. The city council's not doing it. We had a hearing in the South Bronx, and we asked the residents there, how many have participatory budgeting in your district? Not one. And I would argue that the public needs in that district are more acute than they are in this district. And the opportunity for people to participate in participatory budgeting, which would not happen but for this charter revision, because council members aren't doing it, is important and this requires the mayor whoever the next mayor is to do it and it's not a slush fund the members of this commission aren't paid let's just tone down the rhetoric a little bit on that thanks so the civic engagement commission proposal was not a proposal of the mayor it's not part of his agenda getting more people involved actually is uncomfortable for most elected officials because like you guys that come out and we want more of that and i'll just be honest we're not going to get it otherwise you heard what the alternative is, the community assistance unit. The mayor controls it 100%, 100%. It has no public meetings, it's not transparent, it has no other appointers. In terms of bringing agencies together, you know, the DOT has a plazas program where they try to have neighbors as stewards take care of their plazas, but the DOT is not good at organizing civic engagement. And the idea here is that the civic engagement function that supports the rest of our civic engagement throughout the city ought to be done by people who are really thinking about that. And we mostly don't have that. Now, you guys are lucky to have a great borough president who puts a lot of energy into supporting that. But I will just tell you, and I think this is what John was speaking to, it's just not sufficiently true throughout the rest of the city. So this doesn't diminish the role and responsibilities and powers of borough presidents in relationship to community boards. Community boards keep their independence. Borough presidents can keep supporting them. But in those neighborhoods that don't have participatory budgeting because their council members don't want to do it, that don't get the same resources and support from their borough presidents, that don't have the same level of depth and expertise and support and participation from their community boards, a set of people to reach out and make sure there's language access, there's translation, 
there's engagement so you can vote in participatory budgeting, have translation at your poll sites, get information and access to all kinds of spaces of participation. I really think we gotta do it. And if you vote no, you're not voting for a better version of civic engagement. You're voting not to expand uh, participatory budgeting citywide. You're voting not to have more language access in poll sites. You're voting not to resource those New Yorkers who today lack access to all these opportunities. So just okay, we, yeah, we're just gonna close out with a just one, quick just a thought. Correction. Yeah. So we have seen this movie before and it really was called, it is called the Voter Assistance Unit. And it's not mayoral appointed. It's appointed by multiple people, including myself. I have an appointment on that commission. I know I've been. And, and, but, but you said it was just a mayoral appointed commission. No, no, no the and community so, assistance unit. And That's so, what you guys talked well, about. I'm talking doing. about the vote. Community Mayor's Office of Community Assistance. I'm talking about the, call the last time we voted for a voter assistance unit or a civic engagement commission, we did that, and it's had very little impact in the city. When you talk about you know, and as someone who has a citywide perspective, because I've been in citywide office now for five years, I represent people in the Bronx and in Queens, and with all due respect, yes, people, some people want participatory budgeting, but what people really want is to stay in their homes, and they want help with land use and zoning. And we have a mayor who has not given that assistance and has shied away from community-based planning. And I'd feel more comfortable with this proposal if we actually saw the details. We don't know who these commission members are going to be. And quite frankly, you don't know who the next mayor is going to be. But we're basically investing in something that nobody specifically knows. And that could be dangerous for the communities you speak passionately about. People in the Bronx and Queens who are suffering because of the overdevelopment unaffordability crisis. We have an opportunity in, a, in this Charter Vision Commission, not the one that we're talking about today, John, I think you're right. We have to really decide for the next Charter Vision Commission that will go on for a year, that will speak, I think, to some of these major issues, at least the potential. The next commission is the one that we have the best shot at dealing with some of the real issues facing us. Okay. Why we need a commission light now when we have this broad commission in place is a mystery to me, with all due respect. Okay, don't get too confused. There is another Charter Revision Commission coming, coming at you way. next year. We'll be back here same time next year for another uh, debate. So, um, they question it. three, the main event, uh, the, <laughs> the one everybody's um, worked up, more worked up about than the other two for sure around the city um, from what I can tell, there are a variety of elements to this one as well. Everybody here is community board term limits. Hopefully you do take time to look at all the details. Um, there are things in proposal three, question three, that relate to community boards and community board term limits that are also about application processes and putting things on the website and a bunch of other smaller details of tweaks of things that we probably aren't gonna to talk too much about because really the main highlight part of it is instituting term limits, although obviously panelists here can bring up any element they'd like. The element that I'm sure will be touched on by proponents also is that the term limits just insist on a cooling off period before people can rejoin community boards. So that sometimes gets lost in the discussion. I just wanted to mention that um, up front because a lot of people ha that have responded to articles we've written have had the misconception, even if it's in the article, that it's, you know, you're, you're term limited and then you're out. Um, and so I've clarified for people that there is the opportunity to be reappointed. Anyhow, we're gonna come back to Council Member Kalos here if you would like, you're not gonna turn down a microphone, are you? No, sorry. <laughs> okay, so Council Member Kalos on question three. In terms of question three, uh, a lot of folks are saying again that the city council oughta or shoulda or coulda. I will tell you that the thing that I want most for the community boards was to get the community boards the resources they need. 
Uh, once I was in office a little bit, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Council Member Inez Dickens, turned to me and said, you know that I give my community boards money to pay for their urban planners. So now, Board 11, Board 8, and Board 6 get discretionary funding from my office to pay for the urban planners. That being said, it's not enough. I have legislation, I, be I believe Gail is a sponsor of it, uh, to put urban planners on every community board. I used my power as governmental operations chair to force a hearing. We got lots and lots of sponsors, and guess what? It never came to the floor for a vote. And so, once again, I'm very glad to have a process where we can actually go around a, a po broken political process and bring it directly to you, the voters. Uh, the urban planners are going to be housed at the Civic Engagement Commission, uh, which forces my hand and makes me a, a yes on number two. Uh, in terms of it beyond that, one of the things that Scott Stringer did when he became Manhattan Borough President, which was a huge reform at the time, is he said everyone had to actually apply to be on their community board, and if you were already on the board, you had to reapply. Uh, and this is not something that happens everywhere else. In fact, when I first got elected, the first hearing I had was on community boards and the different processes in the five boroughs. You can read it at bencalos.com slash CB for community board. It's 80 pages. It's a thrilling read if you can't sleep at night. And uh, to Gail's credit, she has continued to have the applications available on, and they're also now online. But, and both uh, Scott started this and Gail continues it, you can actually look up who's on your community board. That is not something you can do in all five boroughs. Additionally, something that Gail started reporting on is the demographics of the community board so that you can compare the demographics to your census information to see is the community board representative. That is another bill we had in the city council that again I used my awesome power as governmental operations chair to force a hearing. We had an, an enormous number of sponsors on it and yet somehow we couldn't get it to the floor for a vote. Uh, and so on CB8M, a lot of folks have argued that there's a lot of turnover and I will be honest, Gail has been an amazing partner in working with me to have turnover on the board but I will be honest, it, it has taken courage. Gail gets, Gail can share what ha, her experience has been. My experience is people have threatened me politically. People have threatened me physically. <laughs> Nobody threatens Gail. Uh, but I, I literally have people who will never speak to me again for the rest of my life. And the last time I tried to shake hands with them, they shoved me across a room. And so this is a little bit of what is happening, and so I, I believe in term limits. I, I wouldn't be here without term limits. I believe in them for every level of the city, and I believe in them for the President of the United States. Oh my God, do I believe in them for the President <laughs> of the United States. And places that don't have term limits, I believe become dysfunctional. I think Congress needs term limits. I love the assembly members who are here today, but I believe in term limits too. And it's just because you have a, a and I, we're joined by Rebecca Seawright, we have Dick Gottfrieds, and they're absolutely amazing, but for all of them, there's other folks too, and the hope is to just keep replacing people with great folks, and okay. Uh, okay. thank you. Thank you, and so Councilmember Lander will give his uh, take on question three, and then we'll kick it, kick it to the no side. First, I really appreciate the people that serve on community boards. I served on my community board. It's a lot of work. Uh, and without a lot of thanks. So I think first we should do more to say thank you. It is really, really valuable. Um, so it's no disrespect to people to say we ought to have term limits. I've come to believe they would also be good everywhere in government. Something is lost. Great people who have to go off, they have expertise and their wisdom is missed. I just think more is gained by building institutions that have a culture of leadership development, of welcome, of finding people to groom and grow, of training them in the expertise that they'll need. Um, and I will say that while in some cases in Manhattan there's been attention to this, you know, if you look at Queens, Queens, 26% of Queens is white, 
55% of Queens community board members of white are white, 29% of Queens is Latino, 9% of Queens community board members are Latino. So we are not, and the same is true in age, um, and it's a little less bad on gender, but there's a gender gap as well. We're not getting the representation that we would truly want. And then just on the question of development and kind of its relationship, I'll say two things. First, I do want you to know Revney's position on this question, which they gave at the September 28th testimony to this Charter Commission. First, we reject term limits for community board members. The land use process can be complicated and proper planning takes time. Removing institutional knowledge is not the answer to inertia or to retrenchment. So no on three is the Revney position. And what I will say is, does I everyone see. A, know, does everyone know? Revney is there, everyone in this room knows Revney. Yes, the real estate board in New York. That's sure. the real estate industry. And what I would just say is, boy, I see evidence that young people right now uh, are really passionate about protecting and preserving our neighborhoods. And I am confident that with the tutelage that will come from the wisdom people have over the next eight to ten years, that the new crop of young, energetic community board members will be just as good. Uh, at stewarding our community, at protecting it from overdevelopment, at fighting City Hall, at fighting folks who don't have the interests of our community. If we want a vibrant and inclusive democracy everywhere, including at the community board level, the way to do it is bring more people in. Um, and this is part of doing that. Yep. Who's going to start over here? So, so when, when I became borough president, and I think there's it's interesting that two borough presidents, or one ex and one current, think this proposal is just not the right thing to do. Uh, we engage in something called community board reform. And we turned over 600 community board members in the time I was borough president. I didn't need a mayoral commission or a charter vision commission to tell me to do it. We did it because we campaigned on doing it. We increased the number of women and people of color throughout the community board, Brad, by 40%. And we worked at it every day. And what was interesting and was, was exciting was to see the young people on the community board sitting next to the more seasoned members and seeing that energy and synergy. It was something to behold. Young Ben Kalos was one of my appointees. Yes. And look how that turned out. <laughs> he didn't take all the lessons, but he's here today. But I tell you this because at the end of the day, again, term limit sounds good and it feels good. But if you want to pick on Queens for a second and you're worried about that diversity, at the end of the day, the person and the council members that are making those appointments to keep things the status quo, well, the machine's going to keep that same status quo no matter whether you have term limits or not. There's enough hacks to go around. And if you really want to make fundamental change, then replace those elected officials. It's called elections. And that's what we do here in Manhattan. And if you look at what's happening around the city right now, the success of the no IDC candidates, the success of insurgents around the city, we don't need to be term limited. We need to build a political movement that makes people hold developers and others accountable in this city. That's why this is a bad idea, because people do need to have that experience. And then lastly, I just want to say, again, this Charter Vision Commission, question two and three, if we convened today and came up with five critical issues for community-based planning, if we all sat around and gave our expertise to a commission, if they had taken the time to listen, we could transform urban planning in the city, except we're giving voters a fake civic engagement committee, and term limits for volunteers. Who term limits volunteers? We want more. So uh, I, I, as you know, feel very strongly no on term limits for community boards. And let me give you some examples. First of all, we have 369 new members out of the one 600 in Manhattan. 60% turnover with no, no, law. It is done by making sure that you have that kind of outreach. You Absolutely every corner training is done for the business people, for the labor unions, for the young people. We have trainings before they apply constantly. So you have a huge pool to 
choose from. Then when you have the selection process, you do it to represent the neighborhood. You can look, thanks again to Alden Bonier, you can look at the demographics of the neighborhood and it matches the demographics of the community board. That is what we do. You don't need a law to do that. You just need elected officials who are damn well gonna do it. We work with the uh, council members, but every person who's appointed has to go through a process. All 1,021 who apply are interviewed personally to see whether they are a good fit. But what you don't do is take that person who knows zoning. It doesn't happen. You cannot do eight years zoning. You need more time. Projects. I had a recreation project, 14 years to raise the 14 or $15 million needed to make that project work. That is the kind of long-term memory. I was with a community board member the other day. She's been on 23 years. I tell you, if it wasn't for her, every time they do that district needs statement, it would be garbage without her input because who wants to hear the same discussion every four years? You need not to have that to move forward. And I just wanna say in terms of appointments, urban planners, if you have the commission making the decision as to who the urban planner is for that community board, that would be terrible. Every time you have a rezoning, there's always tension, as there was in Inwood. And what would you want? An urban planner who was selected by the commission, the mayor's commission? Who would that urban planner have their allegiance to? The mayor or the community board? So these projects are too intertwined. They do not have the kind of separation. I want to talk about technology. It says in these proposals that you're going to have technology if you have a commission and term limits. We already have that. We have the dashboard. We know exactly the background, the person, the profession, the rental or co-op of every single applicant, every single member, and that is part of a dashboard. In, That's what Manhattan. you use technology. Yes. For Manhattan. For Manhattan. Well, but my colleagues can just do the same damn thing. So they I'm just could, saying, don't. They have not. I know, but not don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, you need to reelect people. Manhattan as the only borough with No, has you this can reelect. You can elect people who could do the same thing. But I'm saying, don't take the baby and all of that, all that information that is gathered. Manhattan, we have more ULERPs than the entire rest of the city combined. Wait till Brooklyn ends up with real estate projects in every single corner of that borough. You are gonna wanna have that kind of expertise. So we need to plan for the future, not just say what's now, but make sure that in the future, that kind of expertise as everything is turned upside down. I am four 16 and 17 year olds. That was my law, to be able to put those folks on the boards and we have, put the age, downgraded it into the 30s and 40s, so it's not, oh yeah, don't, Scott was on a long time ago, don't get me started, his age. You, you don't want to hear the Queen's okay. age numbers, they're even worse But than I'm just saying numbers. this, I will tell you, please make sure that the expertise and the long-standing members who contribute to the neighborhood, not only on their expertise in terms of zoning, but understanding where that park was, where that school is, so you don't make the mistakes over and over. It's a big city bigger than half of the countries in the world, bigger than all but California and the state of New York and the federal government. We're huge. So when you're there, you are there as representing almost a city all by itself. And you are the eyes and ears and you need long-term uh, memory, institutional memory, to make sure that community is served properly. Let's, we're gonna let, let, we're me, gonna let John, catch, and then we'll come back in a second. Just let me let me explain John how we the, uh, let me explain commission. how we got here. Here's how we got here on on proposal three because this was not the mayor's agenda. We had a series of hearings, and one of them was to talk about community participa participation, community boards, and other things. We listened. A witness we listened to very closely was Controller Scott Stringer who came to a public hearing at the public library and very methodically and thoroughly laid out what he had done and what Borough President Brewer have continued in terms of community board uh, governance reforms. And it was extremely persuasive from a guy who was appointed to a community board when he was 16 years old and then reformed the appointment process as it continued. We were all very persuaded we then went out and held hearings around the city. I'm a corporate lawyer. We advise 
boards on best practices. Here are some of the things we heard about community boards around the city. Boards where there is no public disclosure of who the members are. Boards where nobody has had to apply or been interviewed or been screened. Where I live, I don't live in Manhattan. Where I live, there's an individual who's chaired the Land Use Commission since the 1970s. The borough president who appointed him is out of jail by now and, and I believe deceased. And yet, those appointments continue. We heard about community boards where they meet, there's no agenda, they vote, and only after they vote do they hear public comments. We heard testimony in communities where the demographic composition of the community changed two generations ago, and you'd never know it by looking at the membership of the community boards. So we heard this and we said, I think the, the com commissioners overwhelmingly felt there need to be governance reforms. And the governance reforms that were looked to in substantial measure were the kinds of things that Scott and Gail have done and are advocating. Nothing about this other than term limits, it's a controversial issue, it can, there's good, you know, merits on both sides. But nothing about this proposal which is imposing standards will prevent the Manhattan Borough President from doing what she's doing. What we're trying to do is raise the floor to impose standards, some basic Jack. minimal governance standards of boards around the city. Council, Councilor, okay. I, wanna, I wanna thank you for uh, complimenting the work that we've done as Borough President and the work of Gail Brewer. But with all due respect, and I know, by the way, let me just say that these commission members are some great people. These are not terrible people. They have a point of view, but they are civically engaged and everyone knows our feeling about Brad and Ben. But what you didn't fully comprehend from the testimony I gave, and I thought it was unfortunate, I said to you there were actually things you could have done to codify the work that we've been doing. You could have codified, you could have codified the urban planning program by mandating instead of 15 commissioners who no one knows who they're gonna be, you could have actually mandated a budget for community boards to have an urban planner. Yeah, here's the reason let, we let, did let, 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 let me speak no, to the let, reason we did Let me just give you the five things you missed, right? You could have, you could have created a community-based planning mechanism that many people suggested. You didn't do that. And there were a number of things, we're running out of time. So I think the reason you didn't do it is because it would have taken a lot of time and effort to look at this. And I just wanna say one thing, you know, we in Manhattan, and maybe this is true in Park Slope, we think we're the most progressive, we think we know better than anyone in the whole city. But I wanna say, having traveled the city now for a good part of my elective office career, I don't wanna diminish the struggling communities, people of color, people who have the same concerns about whether they can stay in their communities. And it would have been useful if we had spent more time in Southeast Queens or in Jackson Heights or up on Fordham University and we really sought an engagement process to hear what they needed. They, the last thing they would have said to this commission, I believe, as an observer, was a self, an imposed term limit structure. They would have asked you for five other things. They would have said to the mayor that you should stop imposing rezonings without giving communities resources because we're being pushed out of our communities. The commission should have done something about that. Yeah, they so, should have done something about so that. So let me, I, let me again say what we did here overwhelmingly at hearings outside of Manhattan and, and Brooklyn were people lining up to talk about the membership problems on their community boards of the type that I've described. In terms of the planners, look, there's a substantial... Look at the record. But in the uh, Bronx, in, in the, the Bronx, there were ten people there. In the Bronx, ten. I was there. The day you were there, that wasn't our only hearing. The, 
So, but let me speak to the planners. There's a significant issue about who are qualified urban planners who are going to agree to advise community boards on land use projects when it is going to, it's going to conflict them from other business that they may be in. There's a significant question about how to create this pool of people. There were significant concerns, frankly, about patronage in some places that if you if you give a budget so the mayor for, will for, pick them? for a planner. So is the mayor going to pick who the planners no, are the in the communities? Civic Engagement Commission. But it's run by the mayor. The Civic Engagement Commission has to figure out how to do this. It's and it run will by be, the mayor. It will be a public process, presumably with our public RFPs and public contracting processes. And yes, it's not in, it's a, it's a charter. It's not a piece of legislation. It creates a process that will institutionalize. Johnny, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. No, 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 no. I feel to be very, so very strongly so that that would be a mayoral control. In Inwood, in Inwood, if we had had a mayoral controlled urban planner with the mayor and the council member against the community board, it would have been worse than it already was. Okay, so I have a bunch of your questions here. Councilmember Lander has to head. He's going to give a final thought. I'm going to go through some of the questions and get our panelists to respond, and then we're going to call it an evening. Two things. First, there's no resp you don't have to take the help from the commission's planners. So borough presidents can keep providing planning support. Council members can keep providing planning support. Commu uh, and community boards can find it in other ways. It's on offer. If you want it, it's there for you. If it doesn't work, no one will need to take it. Nothing's going to be foist down your throat. The only obligations of community boards would be to set up a website and to provide some of the information we're talking about. One area, though, where I do think we have a lot of agreement, and I do just want to make this pitch, is our land use process, which this commission is mostly not about because they didn't do a deep dive on it, is in need of much more fundamental reform. I think on that we wholeheartedly agree. So please come forward to this year, the 2019 commission that Gail helped get set up, that the council created through appointment. It is going to do a deep dive into the much more fundamental changes into our land use process that's needed. Don't be angry at these proposals that they're not achieving it. Let's achieve that next year. Let's try to evaluate these proposals in their terms this year. Not thank with, you guys. It's not been with great people to be with just you. for eight years. Thank, okay, so thank you to Councilmember Lander who's gonna head out. And John, you're gonna head out as well? I, I apologize, I have to leave. I have an out of town court appearance and I have to get a flight yet tonight. I appreciate your, your attendance, your participation, and uh, your studying of the issue. And whatever you do, just turn the ballot over, find these proposals, and vote on them on Tuesday. Thank you very much. I have a copy of the ballot. You have to squint when you turn it over because the font is so small. Do you want to um, either? You can take that. OK, let's go through a few questions from the audience. I've been. I've been reviewing, uh, reviewing these questions. There's a lot of great ones. I don't think I'm going to get to every single one. There's also a few that are um, more recommendations that I'll just read out loud. Um, and one of those is that term limits for community board members could have been, should have been staggered so that not everybody is, is term limited out at the same time. So that's, that's more of a comment. Uh, another reason to vote against number three. Another. Another, um, this is more of a question for moving down the line. So someone wrote uh, more for you, Controller Stringer, uh, to think about, well, I don't think we're, I mean, you can address this quickly, but this is less about these questions, to think about some of the dangers in empowering community boards further on land use issues when they're uh, unelected bodies. That's, that's more for down the road, but go ahead if you want to look. As much, as much as I want to empower community boards with resources and to continue the work that Gail has done as well, we also, I also don't believe that the Euler process should start and end with the community boards. And part of it is to give the community a say, but not to have a veto. Part of this is to give the borough president a say, but the borough president shouldn't have the veto. The problem is in the city council, they've acted as a rubber stamp without 
thinking about the broader picture, and that I think we could talk about. Now, by the way, most council members, when I say rubber stamp, I don't mean that they are rubber stamping big development projects, but perhaps the rules could be reformed so that they have more engagement. Is that fair, Helen? We're not, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're not trying to hurt the council. We're just trying to say there's got to be more to it. That's, that's more for the 2019 commission, so we're going to... Please, quickly. Yeah. So uh, Scott Schringer put together a very thorough report. It's actually outside on the tables. Please take a look. Uh, I, I also su submitted something. His, his is actually longer and more thorough, I have to admit it. Uh, but one of the things that I've been suggesting and I suggested for this commission and have now suggested for the further, and we have a Charter Vision Commission that we're committee with CB8. Uh, we're working with Gail Brewer to get one standing on every single community board, but uh, I would just say I would actually want to give the borough presidents along with the community boards and something called the borough board a power to initiate with a triple yes and actually a, a power to stop something or a veto with a triple no. So we wouldn't be giving the power to any individual piece in there, but putting them all together. I don't think that the council should be the lone yes or no vote, and I would like to spread that power out. Okay. Um, one of the comments here is that the proposals are too vague. Whoever wrote that, I encourage you to look online at all the specifics. As I mentioned earlier, there are, there are a lot more details than we've even covered here. Part of the tricky part of voting on charter revisions is that often you get the abstract on the ballot without every single detail. So you, the more prepared you are, the more informed you are, the better you'll be able to, to vote on these. No, I agree, but the commission is vague no matter what language, type, well, font, or that, any other way of looking right, at it. And I've read the that's, whole thing. That, it, that's part, it makes that's, no sense at all. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, another comment, which is interesting for the future, a lot of commenters in the audience, obviously, but I think these are worth, worth hearing, and I want to honor the fact that people took the time to, to write these down, um, is that lumping a lot of these suggestions together in each question hurts some of, the, some of the strengths of some of the individual elements is basically the point here, which is written about question one, but I think applies maybe to, to others as well. They did um, on purpose to question one. That's the way it's written. Okay. Um, this is, oh, this goes back to the issue of not enough information being put out publicly about community boards. I think we covered that, um, that the, in Manhattan it seems to be done quite a bit more than elsewhere. Um, how much, this maybe is for you, Councilmember Kalos, how much will it cost the city if, these, if the campaign finance measures are passed? Less than we lost on Rivington when we gave away a piece of property for 10 million that got flipped for 100 million. But the quick answer is in 2013, the entire campaign finance system, all the public dollars cost $60 million. This changes the public match from 55 to 75%, which is a 20% uh, increase. So, uh, and, and I, will, I, I can also defer to the controller who is the, the <laughs> Uh, person more responsible for this stuff, but my, my guess is at least a 20% increase, uh, which would be about another, uh, it's $12 million off the top of my head. It's going to be up to $18 million. More. It, and, and I think that is, that is, that is such a small cost to get the big money out. That $18 million buys out $70 million in big dollars from one in 20 of those mega contributors and makes, it, it gets rid of $70 million day one. And that's $18 million on, on top of what's already been spent. And a lot of that big dollar is the citywide, specifically the mayor. The city council candidates do an excellent job about getting, the, getting voters, getting con contributions, getting matching funds, and if they keep being punished from getting all of their um, all of their limits um, drastically reduced, and their expenditure limit is just way too low as well. So it's it's something that is has been rushed, and it this it just further goes to the point that this whole charter revision has been rushed. So um, there's just a couple other last points here, um, and and then I think we're going to adjourn. Um, the these are actually both on number two on the Civic Engagement Commission. So um, maybe it's unfortunate that a couple of our panelists had to run, but um, 
I think I might be able to clarify on this one. The, the assumption here seems to be from a couple of folks that this um, Civic Engagement Commission would take over on a citywide basis running the participatory budgeting program in the individual districts. And I'm not sure that's completely how it would work. I think there would be a lot of work with the council members, but, but it relates to resources. But I think we need a little more clarity on that. So, so Go ahead. I, I think part of what we should be careful about is that, yes, one of the goals, apparently, of the commission is participatory budgeting. But you're not voting for participatory budgeting expansion. Why? You don't know who the mayor is going to be. And that he or she could turn around and say, I can't stand participatory budgeting. My commission members will have nothing to do with it. And that will be the end of that. So what we're really voting for in the civic engagement is something that nobody knows what the outcome will be. We won't know who the commission members will be. I, 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 I do think there's certain responsibilities like participatory budgeting that are mandated. And then there's vague so, other so, responsibilities. So, so can I just make a point how the sausage is made? Sure. <laughs> when the mayor says to his commissions, to his commission, you know, you know what they said about participatory budgeting? Here's $10 for participatory budgeting. I'm telling you, it is a lost leader in this. And it sounds good, but there's no real plan in this. So I would just be very cautious. People should not think they're voting for a five borough fully funded participatory budget proposal. What they're voting for is a very vague civic engagement piece that will go hand in hand to a very unfortunate community board term limit piece, meaning everyone should vote no. I have to excuse myself. <laughs> yes, not we're going to wrap it up. Not because I don't love all of you and I miss you greatly, uh, but I want to say that you are the true New Yorkers because you came out to talk about something I personally love. Community boards, the charter, all the things that Gail and I would spend till 2 in the morning if I could. But I just want to thank you everyone too. who came out here. You know what to do in November. We'll see you afterwards. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ben, once again. Sure. And ben. Thank you. And thank you, Gail. Manhattan Borough President, Final, final thought from you? Uh, yeah, the final thought is that uh, well-intentioned maybe, but very bad execution. You cannot execute a commission that is so vague, it could end up being something with ancillary uh, proposals that really are not in the best interest of communities. So I think we can all agree, uh, even uh, when I was with uh, Borough President Eric Adams earlier today, who supports term limits, he is against number two. Who, who's against term limits, he's against number two. He, does, he likes term limits, let me be clear. Second, in terms of the work that is done by the amazing people in this uh, audience, as well as others who are on the community boards, I hope that you understand that eight years is not enough. Nobody's going to be on for eight years, take a break and go back. It just doesn't work like that. And I feel very strongly that as a council member, and I no, Ben Kalos does a wonderful job also. We do rely on that expertise as we sit there uh, demanding from the developer of the city council and the mayor's office. We use the expertise of the community board members to figure out what needs to get done. Those are very dreary times in a windowless uh, conference room when developers, the mayor's office, and even sometimes the city council staff is saying, you must make this decision, you must do X. I rely on the 30 years and 20 years of expertise on that community board to help us guide. Now, other boroughs may do things differently. That doesn't mean that you should throw out all this expertise because there are some bad actors. There are bad politicians, right? They go to jail. That is not a reason to get rid of all of our public policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Ben Max. Thank you. Final thought. Councilmember Kalos. I, I want to thank our uh, New York City controller who spent his night here uh, at this forum. I want to thank our Manhattan Borough President who spent her night. She could be running around. She, she just missed 15 events. <laughs> but th this, this woman does not stop. Her being here is just a testament. I want to thank the people who are here in our live audience. I want to thank people at home. And I guess I, I just want to say, if you think the status quo is working, then, then that's fine, because all this does is, is change a lot of things. 
I will say that as somebody, as, as John was mentioning, who's been fighting for campaign finance reform going back now 13 years, and that's how long these things kind of take, we need a city where every elected official from city council member all the way up to mayor has a system that incentivizes them to take small dollars instead of big dollars. And so I, I don't take money from real estate. Gail's a big small dollar person. A lot of the folks you've heard from are small dollar people and got here through a campaign finance system that encourages it. And listen, there, there's, there's things that can be fixed, that can be improved with everything and, and nothing is, it can be survive, everything can be criticized. It, it's true, that, that's sadly the way life works. But it is not possible to run for higher office currently without going after those checks for $5,100. Big money is, has a corrupting influence. There, there's, there's no question in my mind about it. Any politician who will tell you that they take $5,100 from somebody and has no impact on them, I think there's a repu politicians have a reputation for a reason. And so this is a politician here who's saying, I am begging you, please vote yes so that politicians like myself, like Gail, like others can continue. And honestly, a lot of folks say, well, why can't you just play by the rules of the game and take money from everybody and then just don't pay attention to them like that's a thing. And that's not really how it works. Politicians spend their time dialing for dollars. They spend their time meeting with people. Somebody's not going to give $5,100 over and over again without getting something in return. And this is really about how your elected officials spend their time. And you can either have an elected official like, like me where you can join me this Friday morning, tomorrow morning. We're going to leave here, just open up my office at 8 a.m. And from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., I spend my time with you, my residents, my constituents. And while I do that, I have people coming from all over the city of New York because they can meet with an elected official without having to pay money to do so. And when I tell my colleagues, oh, a, a constituent came from your district, they're like, that's great. I was meeting from, with real estate donors from your district. And so the, okay. the, the real truth is just, I said no to the real estate money. They showed up with a, a pile of money, a pile of checks, and they said, congratulations, you're done fundraising. And I said, I don't want your money. I'm not going to work for you. I'm going to work for the people in my district. And they said, don't worry. This money will be waiting for you when you change your mind. And that is just... That, that is just evil incarnate right. right there. <laughs> We're gonna, so please vote <laughs> yes. We're going to leave it there. Thank you to the folks who put this evening together. Thank you all for being here. And whatever you're going to do, just make sure you go vote on Tuesday. <laughs>